Welcome everyone to our second uh, in our series of uh, Produce Water Treatment and Reuse Seminars. And uh, we've got a really good uh, group of speakers today, um, starting off with uh, Dr. Kyle Murray from the University of Oklahoma, talking about a pathway to recovering critical minerals and industrial elements from Oklahoma's Produce Water. So I think that'll be of great interest to, to all of us. Um, our second speaker is Dr. Mark Nanny, also from the University of Oklahoma, talking about surface enhanced Raman scattering spectroscopy as a real time sensor for polyatomic anions and organic compounds in produced water. And finally, we'll, we have uh, David Levitt from Oklahoma State talking about membrane distillation crystallization of highly concentrated brines and resource recovery from produced water and fertilizer solutions. So um, it's gonna be really interesting talk today. I'm super excited uh, about all of them. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen. And Kyle, wow, you're ready to go. That was fast. So Kyle, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. I tried to share my screen and it looks like I was successful. Um, I've learned my lesson over the last year that I have to minimize the, the video of other participants so that I can see my own slides. So I'm gonna try it this time without seeing your, your faces and just focusing on my slides. So thank you to the organizers for putting together the seminar series on produced water and for allowing me to present on this topic. I'm gonna hopefully present some new information. Some of you have seen some of my work before but I've uh, made a lot of progress on this, this aspect of it. So I've also learned over the last year that it's helpful to prepare sort of a script for, for my slides and read through them. So I'm gonna do a lot of that today and I'll add a little bit of information as, as we go through. So this slide, um, I'm just trying to introduce the produced water research that I've been working on for almost 10 years. In Oklahoma. So this is a little bit of a background story before we get into the meat of the presentation. Sometime during the last decade, we the people of Oklahoma have committed to finding better ways to manage produced water. Better management initially meant injecting less into the subsurface, which could be accomplished if we found ways to reuse the water. And that was usually driven by the, the need to mitigate seismicity. The lowest hanging fruit was to reuse water in the oil and gas industry, which required minimal treatment. Essentially, we treated with a biocide to make something called a clean brine that was then reused for hydraulic fracturing. We're still doing that today. The next level of treatment would require removal of organics and dissolved solids to make fresh water, which could then be reused in another sector, such as for irrigated agriculture. Efforts for desalinating produced water had some momentum a few years ago, but it seems to have tapered off. And unfortunately, to my knowledge, there's not a large scale desalination project in Oklahoma. And I just added this table of data to the slide to try to illustrate why perhaps the, the motivation or the momentum for desalination has declined. You could see that, that last column, the water to oil ratio, that's basically dividing the total saltwater disposal by the total oil production to give us some idea of how much water is generated per unit of, of oil. And you can see that's decreased over the last two years. So that might be part of the reason that we've seen a decreased interest in desalination and, and reuse of water as a fresh, fresh water source to augment supply. So that brings me to the last item. Let's talk about something that could offer a new revenue stream to offset the cost of treating produced water. I would loosely call this resource recovery with the resource being critical minerals or elements that could be extracted from produced water or brines. Those recoverable elements, which I'm calling them, have economic value because they are a commodity, in some cases, a high value commodity. What I'm exploring today is the tie between produced water treatment and critical mineral extraction, which in some cases would use the same technology. That's my longest slide. There have been some efforts at the federal level to 
to study critical minerals and legislation proposed to incentivize production of critical minerals. The USGS, for example, describes critical minerals as mineral commodities that are vital for economic growth, improving the quality of life and providing for national defense. Most of these elements are related to needs in the transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy sources and technologies. Several legislative efforts, I can't keep track of all of them, but a few that come to mind um, have been unsuccessful, but there are newly introduced bills or acts. The American Critical Mineral Independence Act is an example, and that's proof that this will continue to be an important topic to the country. And I'm, I'm missing seeing some faces, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna shift my screen a little bit so I can see some faces. There we go. So what's happening at state level? We have, of course, a produced water working group that many of you participate in. Uh, I have a list of some other things here, a database compilation project that I've been working on for OWRB to put together produced water quality data for Oklahoma, which is instrumental to, to what I'm talking about today. And our universities are finishing year one of a five-year grant from the NSF EPSCoR program. Our grant has multiple tasks related to variable and marginal quality water. You can see them listed here. And finally, on the right side of this slide, I wanna plug the OGS Critical Minerals Workshop coming up in November of 2021, virtually, maybe the last time virtually. I'm taking the lead on the session on res resource recovery from produced water or brines in the Southern Mid-Continent. I'm hoping that others working on some aspect of this topic will reach out to me and help to fill out the water session. So if you're on this call and you have an interest in resource recovery from produce water brines, email me and let me know. I'm trying to, to get some support on that topic. Okay, so what is the pathway to recovering critical minerals from produced water? I know this is a little bit too much at one time, but I've tried to simplify it into eight steps or stages in, in a flowchart form. And I try to highlight some of the action items and topics that need to be addressed in each step. We start with answering the question of what are critical minerals and define some related terms. I'll do that in the next slide. Then we quantify concentrations, masses, volumes, and dollar values along the pathway. I'll walk through steps one through five and give two examples sample elements, hopefully you'll see the potential to develop critical minerals in Oklahoma as part of an ongoing produced water treatment and reuse project uh, marriage or syn synergy. So a little bit heavy on the text, but I wanna define critical minerals and industrial minerals, but also introduce my own terms to the discussion. I have to do things my own way. Critical minerals are most often elements rather than minerals and are considered critical to the US economy and national security. That's kind of the definition from the government. They have important uses and no viable substitutes. In most cases, 100% of the critical mineral resource is imported. So we need to find domestic sources. A subset of critical minerals are also sometimes referred to as rare earth elements. And so in this category, I have 41 critical minerals. Critical recoverable elements or critical minerals that have been analyzed in produced waters. And we have some data to understand their distribution and concentrations. And I've, I've identified 13 that are listed as critical minerals, but also I find them to be recoverable elements. Industrial minerals are naturally occurring elements of economic value. They're not on the critical mineral list, like iodine, for example. And we normally already have domestic supplies of these industrial elements. So the next category, industrial recoverable elements are industrial minerals that have been analyzed and produced waters. And again, we have data to start with. So we have a smaller number of those. Now, if it isn't obvious, I've highlighted the elements that are what I call recoverable in blue, since we are already able to extract them from water. And so this doesn't mean a lot, I mean, just look at definitions. I think the easiest way to kind of visualize what these are is to look at a periodic table of the elements. And Mark Nanny is going to appreciate that. 
uh, with his chemistry interest. I get a pump, pump it up fist there from Mark. So because there's a long list of critical minerals and the other categories that I mentioned, I think it's helpful to, to show them on this periodic table. In this rendition, I've highlighted the 41 critical minerals in light orange to indicate that we do not have any data on their occurrence in produced water. So if it's orange or brown, some shade of, of those colors, burnt orange, um, it's not in produced water to my knowledge. I then highlighted 13 critical minerals in light blue. If we do have data on their occurrence in produced water, light blue. And the same method was used for industrial minerals with molybdenum and silver being in dark orange. So they're not, to my knowledge, present in produced water or we don't have any data on them. And then there's seven industrial minerals in dark blue. So I'm focused obviously on the, the blue, light blue, dark blue elements from this periodic table. And I, I cannot possibly cover all of the critical industrial minerals. So I selected some of the ones that people ask about the most. Selected two of them, lithium as a critical recoverable element and bromine as an example of an industrial recoverable element. And here's some information from the USGS about those two elements. Lithium and bromine recovery from brine in the US and the consumption of both on the chart, along with the commodity prices are shown here. So the value of lithium has been pretty volatile over the last six years, ranging from about $7 per kilogram to $17 per kilogram. Bromine, on the other hand, has had a relatively constant value at just a, over $2 per kilogram. Hopefully you can think how this would be useful. If critical and industrial minerals have value, then we might assess their concentrations in brine, estimate brine production rates, and extraction costs to arrive at some understanding of viability of mineral extraction and production from brine. And then we can merge that into the produced water treatment and reuse equation. So first looking at lithium concentrations from a USGS produced water, produced waters database, we have the sample locations in map view and a box plot on the right, which shows the range of lithium concentrations in six states, which in our critical minerals workshop, we're calling the Southern Midcontinent states. I often use this types of, type of box plot or whisker plot to illustrate concentrations because it shows the middle 50% of the samples with the 25th, percent, 25th to 50th percentile in light green, and then the 50th to 75th percentile in dark green. The whisker, whiskers extend to the left to the minimum value and to the right to the maximum value. My box plots do not always show the minimum and max because they tend to be outliers and are, we're more interested in that middle 50% and the median values for probability type calculations. Hopefully you can see that lithium sample locations on the map are clustered in oil and gas plays. For example, the Permian Basin in Texas and New Mexico, the Eagleford, Southwest of San Antonio, or the Stack Play in West Central Oklahoma. You probably also noticed the larger green symbols on the map indicates higher concentrations, obviously. Um, in the Eagleford, there's some big ones. And then in Southwestern Arkansas, they have very high concentrations of lithium. We have a few in Oklahoma, but not anything to brag about just yet. On the box plot, obviously Arkansas has the highest concentrations with somewhat biased sampling being in that Southwestern part of the state. They kind of ignored the rest of the state in this data set. The map on the left should look familiar again. This, wait a minute. I'm reading the wrong slide here. Okay, so this one is bromine concentrations in map view or illustrated in the box plot. They exhibit the same general trends as lithium. Bromine samples were collected in oil and gas plays, and they are prominent high concentrations in southwestern Arkansas. Again, 
lithium or bromine maps and box plots are really only giving us kind of a general view of data availability, but should help us to think about what can be done with the data. So there are a lot of ways to refine the data analysis and interpretation. So if I move to the next slide, I'm gonna focus now more on Oklahoma and supplement the USGS data with some of uh, our own data from OCC's uh, USC application representative samples and the database that I've been putting together. So the map on the left should look familiar. Again, this, is, this shows the lithium data from the USGS database centered on Oklahoma. The box plot on the bottom left groups the data by geological zone on the y-axis and illustrates the lithium concentrations on the x-axis. So you might say that the median concentration of lithium was highest in wells that produced water from the Arbuckle zone, which might be a surprise to some of us, but that's what the data tells us. That median value is over 10 parts per million from the Arbuckle. The map on the right illustrates the locations of samples containing lithium that we've compiled so far from USC permit applications. And yes, there is a small number, but we're still working through that. Actually, thousands of USC applications still have to be processed. Hopefully we can add more lithium results to the database. The box plot in the bottom right illustrates lithium concentrations again, grouped by geological zone. Majority of samples were collected from Mississippian wells in Northern Oklahoma. In this process, I recently, I didn't get to include it on this figure, but I recently stumbled upon a sample with a lithium concentration of 75 parts per million from the Mississippian and Kingfisher County. So hopefully, if we're interested in recovering lithium, we'll, we'll find more and more data that, that indicates where we would have the potential to recover it. So then uh, the map on the left now shows bromine data from USGS database, box plot on the bottom left again, bromine data by geological zone. And it looks like all zones fall within the 100 parts per million to 1000 parts per million range. Map on the right is for bromine samples in USC permit applications database that I'm putting together. Fortunately, we have even fewer bromine concentrations than lithium and we only have enough samples from wells in the Mississippian and Arbuckle zones to, Arbuckle zones to make it into a, a box plot. Actually, the bromine data mostly came from industry reps. I gave a talk to the Tulsa Geological Society in September of 2020. And after that talk, they shared some data with me. So bromine data is pretty limited, but interesting if, if you look at the, some of the later slides. So that gives you a starting point. We have some idea of some of the concentrations, at least for those two elements. But we also need to understand how much water is produced so that we can calculate the, the mass and then, of course, the, the value of that resource. Because it's expensive to move brine, we must recover elements close to the producing wells. So a produced water treatment and reuse operation, or in my case today, a resource recovery facility would ideally be co-located with a saltwater disposal well. And we know that there are millions of barrels of, per day of brine disposed into Oklahoma's saltwater disposal wells. Uh, as I showed on one of the previous slides, we had over a billion barrels in a year, 1.5 billion, I think was the, the highest rate in one single year. But the median disposal rate for our more than 3,000 SWD wells that are active in Oklahoma is only about 150 barrels per day. And so for economy of scale, it produced water treatment or reuse recovery, resource recovery plant would likely have to be near a 1,000 barrel per day or higher source to make it work. So what if we find recoverable element concentrations that are high enough to focus on resource recovery as the main revenue stream, how do we target an area? So for example, the, the iodine extraction that occurs in Oklahoma near Woodward primarily is based on drilling brine producing wells and they target iodine rich formations that can yield 5,000 barrels per day or more of 
brine. So if we think about the, the data that I showed for lithium or for bromine, uh, remember oddly that the lithium concentrations were highest in the Arbuckle group. And also coincidentally, if you see from this chart at the bottom, this is barrels of water per day per foot of perforated zone from hydraulic tests. The Arbuckle group actually produces the most water per unit thickness if we develop that, that zone. So if we wanted to target lithium, you know, we would potentially look for an area in the Arbuckle that has high concentrations and we could produce a lot of water. And there we'd have, therefore we'd have a lot of mass of lithium. So the point here is that not only do we need to have high concentrations of the recoverable element, but we also must be able to process large volumes of water near an SWD or produce at high rates from wells that make it economical. So there's a lot, lot to consider here, um, but that's kind of the strategy that I would take if I was actually looking for resource recovery as the primary source of revenue. So in this slide, we, we explored the potential value of bromine and lithium using the, the data that I've just shown you in Oklahoma. So based on the density of high TDS water, bromine concentrations, the 2020 commodity value, and assuming that an extraction process is 90% efficient, so we can recover 90% of the lithium and bromine from that produced water. It's not looking too exciting. The, Bromine concentrations are, are fairly low. Um, the value is fairly low. So we're looking at between seven cents and 21 cents of bromine that is recoverable from each barrel of produced water. Lithium concentrations are lower, but the dollar per kilogram value is higher. So lithium, lithium value is less than one cent to about two cents per barrel of produced water in Oklahoma. Again, not very exciting on its own. But if you look at the numbers for our neighboring state of Arkansas, I'm gonna have to hide our faces again here. It's easy to imagine how much of a difference is made by high concentration. So you can see lithium, bromine and lithium in Arkansas in that Southwestern part of the state where the concentrations are very high, you could potentially extract a dollar and five cents per barrel of, br of bromine on the low end, or more than $2.16 per barrel on the high end. Lithium is not quite as exciting, but compared to, to what we're working with in Oklahoma, it is quite, quite substantially higher. So what we might consider doing now at this stage, if we want to, are interested in resource recovery in Oklahoma is continue to collect samples, continue to understand the distribution of that concentration, what formation it's coming from, and identify potential hotspots for, for production. So this is my, my final slide. Steps six, seven, and eight along the pathway can only really be accomplished after the previous steps. I've identified promising recoverable elements, and again, hotspot geographic areas, or target formations. What I hope you take from this final slide is that extraction technologies and produced water treatment processes like you are illustrated here are very similar and can likely be married to one another to not only promote reuse of produced water by treatment, but also at the same time, recover critical minerals and elements from brine resources. So there might be a, a net economic benefit um, to produce water treatment and reuse and economic benefit for critical mineral uh, production. So let me just close by, by thanking you again for the opportunity to kind of flesh this out with, with an audience. We've done, I've done it internally at OGS and, and talked to TGS about it, but now I'm trying to add more details to it. So I welcome your feedback and questions. Thank you very much.